Happy Father's Day. Any fathers in the house tonight? Wave, wave your hand. Any dads? Hey, couple. Can you guys stand? Can we have some dads stand? I want to do this real quick, and I want to pray for them and honor them. Um, just, uh, I, I got teased this today. I was riding the shuttle up to service, and someone said, Happy Father's Day to me. I'm like, ah, oh, not a dad yet. Uh, but he's like, you know, I'm going to prophesy that over your life. I said, hey, I received that in Jesus' name. But we want to honor our dads tonight. So if you're a dad, can you stand? And we just want to pray for you tonight, honor you. Uh, dads in the house, go ahead and stand. I know this is uncomfortable, but we, know, we just want to do this and uh, realize that, uh, you know, so if you're just around them, uh, just gently lay your hands as an impartation of faith. And we want to just honor them tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for these individuals. Lord, uh, uh, it, it takes a lot, Lord, to, to do what they do and and Lord, we can only imagine just the, the kind of pressures that they feel being a father. But we th- Lord, we thank you that you're uh, their heavenly father. And God, you want to be their strength. And Lord, that everything that they need to be a, a, a good dad comes from you. You're the source of life. And I pray that even now, Lord, that you fill them with faith and grace and strength, Lord, to live out the call that you have for their lives, God. And we thank you, Lord, uh, that you love them, uh, God. And I pray, Lord, that... Uh, I know a, a lot of men, we just focus on our failures and where we fall short. But Lord, I pray that you would fill them with just peace. Um, and, and we thank you that your grace covers a multitude of sins. And Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to bounce back and continue to love you in the way that you're calling us to. So Lord, we pray that you would do that through their lives. And we pray for everyone here, Lord, and our dads here. We wouldn't be here without them. So Lord, we want to honor them and thank them for all that they've done in our lives. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. And I have another round of applause for our dads. Um, if we've been in this series called Heart Attack, and uh, we started off this series talking about our heart, uh, and, and our heart is the source of everything that we do. And if it's the source of everything that we do, we should take care of it. We need to guard it. We need to protect it. And so we started off the series just kind of looking at ways in which we need to honor, not honor, but guard and protect our hearts. And then last week, we looked at the one of four ways in which our heart gets attacked. Our hearts are prone to attack. And we talked about guilt last week and how guilt is behind this mindset of, I owe you, meaning that I've done something to hurt you, and so now I'm in a, in a, in a situation I'm, de- I'm in debt to your relationship, so I owe you something, and we're guilty. We feel guilty, and um, because we carry these guilt into our relationships, it affects the way that we interact with one another. We feel like we have to owe and pay things back, and we carry this, we project that into our relationships, and so the cure for guilt is through confession, confessing to God of our sins, confessing to other, one another for healing, but oftentimes taking that last step to confess to the people that we've actually wronged in our lives, and when we do that, God begins to heal our hearts from the guilt and so that we can have healthy relationships. Tonight, we're going to take it a little bit further. We're going to look at anger tonight. We're going to look at anger and what the root of that is and how God can heal us of anger. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be at, verses 26 to 32. And we're going to look at this emotion called anger. How many of us ever felt angry before? How many of us feel angry right now? <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Uh, but anger is a, is a real emotion, and I'm going to look at how God uh, has plans for anger, but also how God wants to work this out of our lives so that we can have healthy relationships, first with Him, but also with other people. So verse 26 in Ephesians, if you don't have your Bibles, don't worry, it'll be up on the screen. We're going to look at the message version, and I love the message version because it communicates in a way that we can understand, and there's a beautiful way in which this passage of scriptures is read. And so Paul, the apostle, is communicating to the church in uh, Ephesi on, on how uh, they can walk out this relationship with God. And he's saying, he's giving them some practical how-tos on how do we actually live this thing out. So it's one thing to be saved, but actually how do you walk out that salvation in your interaction with other people. So Ephesians 4, he picks it up in uh, verse 26. He says this, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. But here's a caveat. Uh, but don't use your anger as fuel for everyone or fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Uh, don't go to bed angry. Why? Because he's saying this, don't give the devil that kind of a foothold in your life. So it's okay to be angry. Go ahead and be angry. But don't stay angry, and then don't even go to bed angry. Why? Because you don't want to give the enemy a foothold in your life. Verse 28, did you uh, used to make ends meet by stealing? This is the way that you make your income by taking from other people? Well, don't do that anymore. When you're saved, you don't do that kind of things. Uh, Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. And everyone said, amen. Get a J-O-B. And and that's very spiritual. Verse 29, walk the way you talk. How is that? Actually, watch the way you talk. 
Uh, let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. We talked about that, how things come out of our mouth, reveals what's in our heart. And he's saying this, uh, uh, let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say what only helps uh, each other as a, a word as a gift. Uh, verse 30, don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. Here's how we break heart, his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take, take such a gift for granted. He's saying basically this, that when we have a relationship with God, God makes a heart, his, uh, our heart his home, and he, becomes, he lives in us. He puts his spirit in us. And said, he said, man, be, be conscious of that, that God, I'm in you, I'm living in you, so don't take that gift for granted. Uh, just because we don't see God around us, sometimes we feel like we can do whatever we want, but we, it changes our perspective when we realize that God is actually with us everywhere we go, and actually takes it even a step further, it changes when we realize he's actually in our hearts. Uh, and so he's saying, don't take that gift for granted. Verse 31, make a clean break, or in the NIV it says this, get rid of uh, all cutting backbiting, profane talk. So get that out of you. Get rid of that. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. So basically talking about anger tonight, we're going to look at these passages of verses to really see how God wants us to deal with this in our lives. And so if you're taking notes, the title of my message tonight is Damage Control. Damage Control. God, we thank you for your word. Bless it. Speak to our hearts tonight. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. So damage control. Uh, how many of us, uh, you've, if you think about right now, what really is your pet peeve? Just think about what bothers you the most. Um, I, I have a lot of different pet peeves. Uh, I've talked about this before. I don't like people who talk during movies. Like, that's one of my pet peeves. Like, don't talk. Like, just watch. Don't ask me questions about what we're watching, because I'm trying to figure it out just like you, you know? Like, so we have pet peeves. Another pet peeve of, of mine is uh, uh, people who, uh, <laughs> this is getting weird, <laughs> people who, uh, uh, very, they're very S-y when they speak. You know, S-y, like, like like that, when they because it sounds like a sprinkler to me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like very essy when you speak, but I don't know, I'm not like teasing, but it's just kind of like, it's just weird things that bother me. I don't know. How many of us have weird pet peeves, you know? Uh, I think we all do. Uh, and, and I was thinking about uh, just anger, and, and as I'm preparing for this message on anger, it's funny because uh, God actually puts you in situations to walk out this, this thing called anger. So I'm, you know, prepping on anger, thinking about this message, and uh, it, within a matter of a, a week and a half, just things started to happen to my car that just was like weird out of the ordinary. And so uh, two weeks ago on a Monday, I'm going to pick up uh, some of the, the, these youth that I wanted to invest in. They go to my alma mater, so I feel like I give back to the, the next generation. And so I'm hanging out with them, and on my way to go get them, a truck uh, that has paint in the back of the truck, uh, a, a bucket of paint literally falls off the truck and paints everywhere. So I see it. And I avoid the bucket of paint, uh, and I drive off, uh, not thinking that because I avoided the paint, that I was in the clear, uh, the, the paint bucket, I was in the clear, uh, r not knowing that while I'm driving, my car tire actually ran runs over wet paint, and what happens is that now my tire is spraying paint all over the side of my car, with me not even knowing, okay? And so I go <laughs> to pick up the, the kids, we hang out, uh, we, we go to the beach, we eat and different things. I drop them back off, and then I go and park my car, and as I'm going to where I'm supposed to go, I notice on the side of my car, white paint on the entire side of my car. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? And then I look in my, my tire well, and there's literally paint everywhere in there. And so by this time, this is later on in the afternoon, I'm trying to clean it, it doesn't come off. Like, the paint is stuck there. Now, there's paint on my paint, and now that's a, a weird situation, so I'm trying to figure out what to do. So I call uh, uh, Sean, he's a, our up-and-coming campus minister. Uh, his dad owns a painting company, so, company, so I text him, I say, hey, uh, Uncle Eddie, I need help here, and so he said, bring the car by, and he, he has some cleaner, he said, that can help me, so we spray the cleaner on the side of the car, it doesn't come off. And I'm like, oh no, like, you know, like I talked about last week, I'm a real weird person when it comes to my car, and so it's not coming off. I'm trying to stay calm at this time. Like, it's just my car. It's okay. It's just, it's, it's just material things, right? And so it's not coming off, and so I, my auntie owns an auto body shop, and so I text her. She's like, come bring it by and we'll check it out. And so I bring it to her, 
And then she looks at it like, whoa, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do here. So we, they tried everything. It's not coming off. And so what they literally had to do was sand and uh, buff my, my paint. So basically they had to sand it down. It literally took almost two hours just to get the big chunks off. And there's still like speckles of paint on the side of my car. And there's a lot of paint still in the tire wall. And so that was just like one thing that I was like, all right, just stay calm. And so this past week, actually this past Thursday, I had a pretty... Uh, pretty full day that I needed to do. So that was one incident with my car. And then on Thursday in the morning, I noticed that my tire was low and I had the tire pressure light come on. And so I go fill it up with air uh, and go do my errands. And I realized that I, when I parked my car at, the, at my work, my tire was still low again. And so it was, wasn't low enough where it's flat. You could still drive it. So I drove it again, filled it up with air. Uh, and the same thing in the next morning. I'm like, oh, okay, now I, I have a slow leak in my tire. So I'm driving now to go to Sam's Club to fix my tire, to get it patched. And on the way to driving to Sam's Club to get it fixed, my car literally just shuts down as I'm getting on the freeway. Like, all the lights come up on the dashboard, and I can't, gas it can't turn it, it just shuts down, and I have to pull over on the side of the road. I'm like, what the heck is happening? I started back up, I just hear this grinding sound. Like, this random grinding sound. I'm like... Okay, that doesn't sound good. And so I'm like thinking, just get to Sam's Club to get their tire fixed, and then we'll figure out the next step there. So I started back up, and it starts to go, and I'm praying like in tongues the entire time. God, help me get to the destination. So I get to Sam's, I uh, get it okay, and, and then the, the check, the, the oil like comes on and off, and so I'm like thinking, okay, that's next. So just to fix the tire now and get the, the thing, uh, the car changed, uh, fixed after. So they're looking at the tire to take it off, and the guy comes to me and says, oh, the, the, the leak is on the side of the tire, so we can't fix it for you. And so I'm thinking, like, okay, just stay calm, right? Stay calm. And so I'm thinking, all right, I just got to take it to a place that I normally fix my car. Just take it there. and Just get it there, and we will be okay. Uh, I'm driving now to this place, which is about 10 minutes away, and as I'm driving there again, the car literally shuts down. I'm like, oh, no, start it back up. Still grinding sounds happening. Uh, we're right about to make the left to get into the place my car dies out again. I'm just like, just get there. So I finally get there and uh, let them know exactly what happened. Long story short, my car was leaking oil. I had no oil. So basically the grinding sound was just my engine just like making all of these, I don't know what they call it, but it just it wasn't good for it. There was no, nothing like uh, soothing the friction in the engine. I don't know what kind of words it is. Uh, so... So I had no oil, they had to change my tire, basically I was leaking oil, long story short, it was just a bad day. How many of you ever had one of those bad days, like when it rains, it pours, like I just felt that. And so the whole time I'm thinking to myself, just stay calm, but I'm getting angry on the inside. The reason why I'm getting angry is because things aren't going my way. How many of us feel like that? We're just things aren't going my way. Things, this random stuff, like we shouldn't be having car issues, it's just not going our way. And anger a lot of times is rooted in this mentality and mindset of just stuff not going your way. Actually, in your notes, it says this. Anger is not getting what we want. The root of anger is, is not getting what we want. And anger says this. You owe me. So when it comes to my situation, I felt like I deserved to have my day go the way I wanted to. I planned it out. And because it wasn't going according to plan, the reason why I got angry is because it was messing up with my schedule. I had an expectation of what my day should have been like. And because it wasn't going the way I wanted it to, uh, things started to happen, I started to get angry. And so anger is rooted in this mindset of you not getting what you want. And, and oftentimes, anger comes up in our lives when we don't get what we want, when you don't get the expectation that you want, when you have uh, expectations of things that you wanted to happen in your life, and it's not happening, we get angry. We get angry. And the mindset is this, you owe me. So basically, we're saying this, something is owed to you, and now there's a debt in the relationship where we feel like we are owed something. And so we wanted something, we didn't get it, and we were convinced that we deserved it. Or we didn't want something and we got that, and so we get angry. And so if, if Leanne did something to, uh, the, to, to me, basically if Leanne hurt me or said something bad about me, now there's a debt in the relationship. I get angry at her because she basically took something from me and I say, you owe me. In all of our relationships, the reason why we get angry at the people is because we feel like they took something from us that we deserved. And oftentimes, because we feel like we deserve it, we project our anger onto them because we feel like you owe me now. And in a lot of our relationships, that's the root of anger, is that there's a debt in this relationship, 
and we feel like we deserve something. It could have started with one person, but after a while, this anger starts to boil in our life. Now we feel like everyone owes us. Now we go into our relationships with this mindset that you owe me somehow. And the reason why we get so angry at people is because subconsciously we're projecting our frustrations of being owed something onto them in our lives. And so anger has that capacity to really cause us to have dysfunctional relationships. And I realize that there's two types of people, uh, and two types of people, when they get angry, there's two types of people and responses towards anger. There's uh, uh, stewards and spewers. Write that down in your notes. Stewers and spewers. The first person is a spewer. This is what a spewer is. They express their anger. Uh, they express it. Like, and here's, what, here's, here's the person who's a spear. When they're angry, everyone else around them knows that they're angry. Like, you make it known that you're angry, and, and you, you sometimes come off with the S's, you know, to everyone. You're very sassy. Hands and head go at the same time. You know, that's kind of anger. And we basically let everyone. Like, if you're angry with someone in text messages, all caps. You know what I mean? You just want to let them know, like, I am angry at you right now. Caps, that's what you get, all caps. <laughs> and so everyone around you knows that. Here's the, the other person, a steward, they're different. Instead of uh, expressing everything, here's what a steward does. They, ex they suppress their anger. Uh, and these are the scary people because uh, everyone around them doesn't know that they're angry, but they are getting angry in the moment. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know what, instead of talking things through, talking it out with other people, uh, what a steward does is they start to suppress it, and they internalize it, and they start to have an internal dialogue. So out of the two, a spewer and a stewer, uh, who do you think you are? How many of us would uh, relate to a spewer? You let everyone know that you're angry. How many of us would say that? Be honest in church. There's some of us there. All right? You know, you just kind of like, you know, everyone around you knows that you're angry. And the rest of us, how many of us relate to being a stewer? Like, you just internalize everything. Y'all are scary. Uh, <laughs> Because you got a you got smile on the outside, but then you're stewing up on the inside, right? You're just like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, nah. We cool, we cool, we cool. And your mind saying, we're not cool. You know what I mean? You got the smile on the outside, but everything is boiling up on the inside. And they're scary people. I mean, and all of us, uh, we bend towards one way or the other. That's our way of dealing with this emotion called anger. Anger is a real emotion, and the way that we deal with it doesn't reveal a lot about us individually, but it actually reveals a lot about what's happening in our hearts. Uh, and so we all fall on one end of the spectrum or another. And here's what happens. You might not even be thinking, I don't get angry that much. If you really want to know if anger is an issue in your life, ask the people closest to you. And you got to be, and when you do ask them, you got to go into the conversation thinking that I am not going to get angry with whatever they tell me. Because <laughs> oftentimes it's like, I'm not angry. And then the people say, no, you really have an issue with anger. You are lying to me right now. Don't tell me I'm angry. Like, oh, buddy, calm down. You know, like go into this situation with, uh, with honest thinking. Like, so just let me know. If I have an issue with anger, just let me know. And the people around you will let you know if you have an issue about it. And if you start to get angry, you realize that is a big issue in your life. And here's the thing about anger is this. Uh, oftentimes, when our hearts are stirred, we become aware to what's really in our hearts. So when we get angry, it's actually a sign of what's happening internally in our, a lot of our hearts. But instead of dealing with the reason why we're getting angry, oftentimes we just project our anger to other people because it's easier to blame someone for our anger than actually dealing with the root of anger in our lives, if we're honest. I'd rather just blame you for the reason why I'm frustrated rather than actually look at my heart to see, why am I getting angry for? Why is this bothering me? And oftentimes we do that. That's why the people closest to us actually get the real version of us. You ever notice that? That you're not really angry towards everyone, but you express your anger to the people that you call family and friends, right? Like your BFF really knows you because you really express who you are to the people around us. Actually, our filters are less... on towards the people that really know us than the people who don't know us because we are more, I guess, relaxed to be ourselves in these environments. And so anger is just basically one of the ways that God allows us to see what's really in our hearts. And he uses that to surface what's happening in our hearts to help us to get deeper, to look at the, the root of the anger in our lives. There's a couple quotes 
that I wanted to talk to us tonight about anger. One of, one of this is this. Uh, anger is one letter short of danger. Ooh, think about that. Just one letter away from danger. Anger is never without reason, but seldom with a good one. Benjamin Franklin said that, saying that, you know, we all get angry, and we have reasons to justify our angers, but a lot of times the reason why we're angry is not really a good one if we think about it. And the last one is this. It's a lot easier to be angry at someone than it is to tell them that you're hurt. Think about that. Tom Gates said that. It's easier just to just tell them, express anger towards someone, they really be honest, saying, man, I'm just hurt by the situation. And oftentimes, the hurt people are the most angry people because they haven't really dealt with things in our lives. Next point in your notes is this. Unresolved anger leads to bitterness. Ephesians 4, the verse that we just read, goes into detail about this. Basically, it says, don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Uh, don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. And the NIV basically says this, in your anger, do not sin. So anger in itself isn't sin, but sin is often the outcome of anger in our lives. Don't you ever think, and you ever think about the most dumb thing that you've ever done in your life? Uh, and the emotion that motivated you to do that was probably anger. You realize that we, sometimes we say the things that we regret the most and we do the things that we regret the most because oftentimes we're motivated by this emotion called anger. So the Bible is saying this angry, anger is not sin, but the anger actually is the, the root and the motivation for a lot of the sin that flows from our lives. So he's saying this, don't go to bed angry. Uh, anger in itself isn't wrong, but don't go to bed angry because what happens there is when you get angry, go to bed angry, it starts to produce this thing called bitterness. And this thing called the foothold, in the Greek is this word called tapos, and that word basically means this. It's an opportunity, a location, a place, or a room. So when Paul is saying here, don't give the enemy a foothold, what he's saying is this, don't give him a room in your heart. Don't let him take residence in your heart because of this anger. Now he's basically saying this, that all of our hearts have rooms, and anger is one of the things that really gives the enemy access into our hearts. Think about that. So if God is in our hearts, when we give him our heart, what would allow the enemy into our hearts to get access is through this thing called anger. So don't allow him to the open door of anger to live inside of your heart. The longer we're angry, here's why he says don't go to sleep angry. The longer you're angry, the more room we give for the devil to actually work out anger for bad in our lives. So we're giving him room and time to actually do a lot of things. That's why an angry person is a hurt person. So when he's saying this, don't give the enemy a foothold, he's saying this, it's okay to be angry, but don't stay angry. Because oftentimes when we stay angry, anger becomes the seed for something much deeper, and it's called bitterness. And that's why in Hebrews, God is so interested in us having to free our hearts from this thing called anger. He says this in Hebrews, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. So we can actually fall short in receiving this grace that God wants to give us. And here's what he says. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, causing or corrupting many. Before bitterness actually takes root, you know what the seed of it is? Anger. The seed of anger is sown into our hearts. And anything that has a seed, what does a seed do? It eventually starts to grow, right? A seed, like anything else, is small. It's relatively insignificant. A seed is such a small thing. And, but eventually, if a seed is not taken care of, it would actually start to grow into a root. And you know what a root does? This is what a root does. A root absorbs, it stores, and grows. And as it grows, it produces poisonous fruit. So that's what a root does in our lives. And so here's the thing about a root. So once a seed is, is sown into our heart, you never really see the root until it begins to come to the surface of our lives, right? By the time it comes to the surface, you know what it is? It's, it's already grown a lot in our hearts before it even makes its way to the surface. Roots usually stay hidden for a long time before it even makes its way to the surface of our lives. That's why God is saying in his word, don't let that thing happen on the inside of you because after a while, before, as it makes its way to the surface, it's already too late because it's already been brewing up in you for a long time. So he's saying, get it at the root. 
Because once the fruit starts to come out the lives, our lives, it starts to negatively affect all of our relationships. And what it says is to contaminate. Basically, all of our relationships become contaminated because we're spewing onto them these unresolved issues of anger in our hearts that was started as a seed, but because we didn't check the seed, it started to grow into a root, and the root started to produce fruit in our lives. And we're trying to deal with the fruit, but God is saying, no, no, go deeper than that. It's not just these external things that you're trying to worry about. Let's go deeper. Let's get to the heart of the issue, and let's deal with the root in our lives. Oftentimes, we start to deal with the fruit, but God loves us too much to leave us that way, so he wants to deal with the root in our lives. And I realized for me, I had a lot of control issues going up. How many of us would say that you have control issues? Uh, and the reason why I started to have control issues is because of this. I had numerous incidences when I was a kid where I felt out of control, where I felt like things were out of my control and things happened that I couldn't positively or negatively influence. And because of those moments and feeling vulnerable and feeling not being able to do anything about it, I started to have and develop this thing called control issues. People with control issues usually have these issues because of a moment in their life where they felt out of control. And so the natural response to that is to try and keep everything in control. So you become this control freak because what you're doing is creating an environment for you to feel safe in uh, and to function in, but it's basically on your terms and on your time. And so these environments that we create is basically control because it's rooted in a place where you were out of control and something happened to you. And you don't like being vulnerable that way. You don't like feeling that way. So we try to control people, our environments, and so forth. And so when I got into ministry, uh, I really wanted to help people. But as you're helping people, I know a lot of people do this. It's like when you're meeting with a person and you're getting their story, you want to help them for the better, you give them advice, right? We point people to Jesus. We try to give them some good advice of what to do. And oftentimes when I was early in my ministry days meeting up with people, they wouldn't listen to what I told them to do. You ever had people in your life where you, they want your advice and you give them advice and then they do the exact opposite of what you told them? How many of us have ever been like that? How many of us have actually done that? Someone gave us advice and we're like, no, nah, nah, thank you, but I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> And so what happened is I, used to get, I started to get angry at people. And the anger wasn't, in, <clears throat> wasn't rooted in love because I genuinely concerned, was concerned about their future. The anger was rooted in control where I felt like, you weren't listening to me. Why am I giving you my time? You're not actually following what I wanted to do. You're not worth my time. And you know what happens when we start to control people? Uh, we, we get mad at them when they don't do what we want them to do. It's not in love, though. I wasn't like, oh, I'm cared about your destiny. I'm just like, you just wasted my time. <laughs> That's really what it was. It wasn't rooted in love. It was rooted in control. It was rooted in this, this control thing. I started to try to control people. When they didn't respond how I wanted them to, I got angry. Uh, and so what happens is I, I, I noticed that I would cut people off really early in, the, in my, my discipleship days. When they didn't do what I wanted to them to tell them, like just, it wasn't three strikes. It was one strike. You know what I mean? Like one strike. All right, I gave you my time. All right, go figure it out on your own. You're on your own right now. And God started to work and reveal that, you know, I still mask that as if, man, they just, you know, they wasted my time. Or one, as just like I poured into them and they didn't reciprocate. And it was very a conditional relationship. And I realized that God doesn't love us conditionally like that. I, God started to reveal to me, like, my love for you uh, is not conditional, meaning that I continue to love you even though you don't do everything that I want you to do. And so because God started to work in me, it's hard to love someone that you're angry with. Does that make sense? Like, if I'm angry with someone and I want to really invest into their life, if I'm angry with them, I can't really love them at the same time. And so I realized that a lot of the people that I tried to pour into because they weren't doing things my way, it's, just, it's easier to cut them out of your life. Like, all right, deal with it on your own. Go find someone else to talk to. Uh, and God had to work that out in me. And really the root of that was just control. Control. My anger was rooted in this idea of control because something was taken away from me where I felt out of control. I started to project control into every situation that I was in. And so for us, God wants to get to the root of this issue, not just deal with this anger thing. Why are you getting angry with people? That's just the manifestation of something that's happening much deeper in our lives. But to get to the root, it's actually a hard work. It's not easy. It takes a lot of reflection, a lot of prayer, and a lot of actually feedback from other people to really get at the root of the things that God wants to get out of our lives. And here's 
a couple of things that I want to share about that is getting angry is actually punishing, your, punish, punishing yourself with the mistakes of other people. When we get angry, we're basically punishing ourselves because of the mistakes of other people. You realize that you're giving control of other people to really control how we react and response. Uh, and so anger is rooted in that. We're just punishing ourselves. And the more anger towards the past you carry in your heart, the less capable you are of actually loving in the present. You realize that, that a lot of the issues that we have in our hearts are usually from our past. And because we carry that into our present, we can't really love people today if we haven't dealt with issues of yesterday. And there's always going to be a lid to the, the relationship in our lives, and God wants to deal with that. And here's how we deal with the root. Here's how we get to the source of the problem. Forgiveness breaks the power of anger off of our hearts. We're going to talk about four areas. In every single one of these areas, it's good, the, the solution to it is going to sound simple, but it's not actually easy to walk out. And so confession, yeah, easy. Sounds simple, but it's difficult to walk out. Forgiveness, yeah, sounds great. Actually difficult to walk out because forgiveness is a process. For us, not only to understand how we are forgiven by God, but actually how do we extend that forgiveness to other people. That's why Ephesians 4.32 says this. This is the heart of the, the message tonight is this. Forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Think about that. Why are we supposed to forgive other people? Because God forgave us. How are we supposed to forgive other people? Quickly and thoroughly, as, Christ, as God in Christ forgave us. You think about that. Quickly and thoroughly. That's specific words that give us specific actions in our lives. And this forgiveness thing needs to be immediate. That's what God is saying, activate this muscle immediately. But oftentimes, it's a process for us to actually start to activate this muscle of forgiveness. It takes a while. And God wants to give forgiveness to us, but he actually wants to extend forgiveness through our lives. The foundation of our relationship with God is based on this premise of forgiveness. God canceled the debt of sin in our lives so that we can have a relationship with him through his son. He canceled the debt. The, get, the debt was canceled with us, but there's still actual payment that needed to be done for the debt. And that payment was displayed on his son on the cross. That's why it was a brutal, bloody death, because that's what the penalty of sin deserved, was death. And Jesus had to suffer death so that that debt could be canceled. You know, if you, if you uh, got into a car accident and hit someone's car, and they came out and looked at the damage and said, I hey, don't worry about it. Uh, they're basically uh, forgiving you of the debt, but that debt still needs to be paid. He still needs to go get that bumper fix or whatever damage that they had to the car. They're just basically freeing you from the payment of actually paying for the damage, but damage still needs to be paid for. Our sins still needed to be paid for, and that's why Jesus had to pay for the penalty of our sin by receiving death upon himself. And so God is saying, because I canceled the debt of sin with you, now the foundation of our relationship is forgiveness, and the foundation of all of your relationships will be on that same premise, forgiveness. Forgiveness. So forgiveness is something that we receive from God, but also something that we release to other people in our lives. So how do we walk that out? It's a process. For, I don't want to call it steps, but it's actually four ways in which we need to activate this process of forgiveness in our lives. Four ways that we need to do this, this process for forgiveness. It is in your notes and it would be up on screen. The first step is this. Identify who you're angry with. Identify who you're angry with. Basically, what that means is to write down on a piece of paper every person that you're angry with in your life. Every person that comes to mind that you, got, you start to get aggravated with, basically, God is saying, these are the individuals, because I'm allowing this anger to point you to something deeper, these individuals are people that you actually need to extend forgiveness towards. So you make a list of all the people who have mistreated you and taken advantage of you. Make a list. Write it down. Some lists might be long. Some lists might be short. But basically, anyone that comes to mind. So ask yourself some of these questions. Who do you hope to never see again? Think about that. Like, who do you hope to never see again? And if you actually saw this person, 
Like if you're in the mall and you see them and you walk in the opposite direction, that might be a person that God actually wants you to extend forgiveness towards. So who do you, who do you not want to see again? That might be someone that God is saying you need to extend forgiveness to that person. Who do you find yourself having imaginary conversations over? Like because they did something to you, you think in your mind, oh, if they ever, ever see them again, I'm going to do this or do that. Or because of something that happened in the past, you say, man, the next time I see them, I'm going to do this and do that. We start to have these imaginary conversations in our mind directed towards a person. That might be a person that you need to extend forgiveness towards. Here's another question you can ask yourself. Who do you secretly desire to fail? Who do you secretly desire that if you saw them fail, it would make you happy? That might be a person that reveals this issue called uh, that God wants us to extend forgiveness towards. Who would you like to pay back if you could get away with it? Like if you could actually do something to pay them back, who would you do that to if you could get away from it? And this means we've got to think through family, friends, exes, co-workers, coaches, bosses, individuals in our lives who, for, for good or for intentional or unintentional, basically hurt us along the way in the process. This isn't the fun part about it, but actually making a list brings an awareness to where God wants to bring healing in our lives, but also brings awareness to the people that we need to extend forgiveness towards. This is basically the first step to purging our hearts of this thing called anger. Uh, number two is this, determine what they owe you. Now that you have a list of, list of names, you write down, determine what they owe you. And this is a step where people usually skip because we just make a list and we say, I choose to forgive them, choose to forgive them. But we need to ask ourselves this question, what do they really owe us? So like, what do we feel like they owe us in our lives? We, we know what they did to us, but what exactly did they take from us? And the reason why we need to do this is because general forgiveness doesn't heal specific hurts. Doing a blanket prayer of forgiveness for people doesn't heal the specific hurts in our lives. And the more specific we are about what was taken from us, the more specific God can begin to heal our hearts from this. So what do the people on the list owe you? What did they take from you? Do you feel like they, they owe you an apology? Did they take money from you? Did they take your time, maybe your purity and your innocence? Maybe they, they harmed you. Maybe they took trust from you, they took a chapter of your life, took away your childhood. What exactly did they take from you, and what do you feel like you are owed? We can't cancel a debt that we haven't clearly identified in our lives. So God wants to say, what, what exactly did they do? Then we take it on to the next step. And this is why this is the difficult process, because a lot of times this is us taking steps towards walking this out, and it's, it's often painful. Number three is we just, then we cancel the debt. After identifying what was taken, after identifying what was done to us, then we must cancel the debt. Canceling the debt basically is this. They don't owe me anymore. Because of what Christ has done for me on the cross, I'm making a decision today to say, you don't owe me anymore. You don't owe me anymore. Forgetting a debt is not the same as canceling it. Does that make sense? Oftentimes people think that you just got to forgive and forget. No. Forgetting a debt a debt. It's not the same as canceling it. You can cancel a debt and still remember it. And just because you haven't forgotten it doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven them. Because oftentimes the pain of the event is so real, it's difficult to forget. But the only thing that we can do is say, I'm going to cancel that. I'm not going to hold them against that. Hold that against them anymore. And this is how we can do it practically. We can actually do some physical things to remind us that we've actually taken steps towards forgiving them. So now that we have a list... Now that we've written them down, oftentimes in our, uh, our RISE classes, is going to be known as our Freedom Weekend. Uh, they do this where you can rip up the paper to remind yourself and saying physically that I'm canceling this debt. You can uh, burn it and just saying I'm letting this go of my, off my life. I'm making a decision to cancel it. Uh, we can actually do this too. We can uh, write on it, paid in full, and every time these emotions of of Anger comes back in our life, we can just open up that paper and say, no, I already canceled that debt anymore. They don't owe me. They don't owe me anymore. So we can do this in our heart. We can just say, God, I choose to forgive so-and-so for what they've done. Uh, and we can do that. And that's a way of us just starting to take steps towards walking out this forgiveness. And oftentimes, saying, I choose to forgive so-and-so is oftentimes the hardest thing to do. It's hard. It's difficult. That's why it's a process that we walk out and it's difficult, but our heart needs it, and God is actually 
with us in the process, and He wants to bring healing to our lives as we do the difficult thing. So we, we forgive, saying, is that, nah, you're not going to owe me anymore. I'm not going to carry this debt any longer. And then we complete the process by doing this last thing, is doing this. We dismiss the case. See, after we've taken the steps to, to identify, to, to, describe, to say who did it, what did they did, choosing to cancel the debt, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be emotions that come back after that moment was done. And that's the process, why it's a process, because as you're walking out forgiveness, there's going to be things that trigger in your life that remind you of what happened. Every single time an emotion and a memory comes back to you and brings up anger, you have to just say, no, I already canceled that debt anymore. They don't owe me. So every time you want to make a case towards that person, you say, no, I already canceled that. They don't owe me anymore. And the longer we do this thing, the more our hearts are going to be freed from this anger, freed from this bitterness, and the more experience, the more forgiveness we're going to be able to experience in our life as we're taking steps to choose to do this to other people. It's not, it's not the easiest road. Trust me, I've done this numerous times with numerous people, but our heart deserves it, and God wants to give us freedom, and it's, the freedom comes through this process of walking it out in our lives. You ever ask the question, why is it difficult to forgive? The reason why it's difficult to forgive because it hurts. It hurts. It's painful. It doesn't feel right to actually extend forgiveness. It doesn't feel right in the moment. Actually, if we wait to feel like forgiving someone before we forgive them, we're never going to do it. That's why feelings follow obedience. We don't wait till we feel like doing something in obedience. We do it in faith, and then the feelings will eventually follow later. Here's what I realized about people who are hesitant to forgive. They're evaluating this, th that decision based on what was done to them rather than what was done for them. Meaning this, I'm looking more, I'm focusing my energy and effort towards what was done to me rather than what was done for me. What was done for me? Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And when I focus more on what he's done for me rather than what was done to me, I'm able to express and release forgiveness to that person. Because I'm forgiven, now I'm able to extend forgiveness to other people. It always goes back to that. If we're, dif we're having difficulty in forgiving other people, it's because we haven't fully understand with God how much we're forgiven in Him. And so it always goes back to that. We forgive as we are forgiven in Christ. I extend forgiveness to others as I understand how much forgiven I am in Him. And it's a process. And for many of us, it's going to take time. It's not an instant thing. We do instantly choosing to forgive, but that process to actually feel like we're forgiven is that it takes time for that thing to be walked out in our lives. And the longer that we choose to do this, the more that we're going to see our relationships start to uh, benefit from it, but it's us doing the difficult things in our lives. Many might be asking, how many times are we supposed to forgive? My answer to that is, as long as it takes. As many times as it takes for you to actually experience the forgiveness and feel like you're forgiving them. And forgiveness is way different than reconciliation. Oftentimes we think that we have to be best friends with the people who hurt us, and it's forgiveness and reconciliation are two separate things. Forgiveness is immediate and unconditional. Reconciliation is conditional based on trust. And you don't have to reconcile with everyone, but we do have to extend forgiveness to everyone. And we do it because God has done that to us in our lives. And I love this quote, forgiveness is setting the prisoner free, not realizing that the prisoner was ourselves. And we were the prisoner in the process, and God was setting us free as we choose to release the other people in their lives. I've done this, like I said, and I know it's difficult, and even coming into tonight, I just knew, like, this is not the flashiest topic, but it's the necessary topic. It's needed for our hearts, and you might not have to forgive someone now, I realize that, but eventually you will. And for many of us here, a lot of times we're having difficult relationships now because we haven't chosen to forgive people who've hurt us in the past and they've wronged us. And, and if we had a story and a time to com have conversation, you would probably convince me on reasons why you can be angry towards that person. I'm just going to give you one reason that you shouldn't because Jesus loves that person just as much as he loves you. You realize that Jesus was a friend of sinners? And before we had a relationship with Christ, we were technically a sinner that he was still a friend to. And that 
He's a, he wants to be a friend to the people that have hurt us in our hearts, in our lives. And he's not condoning what was done. Forgiveness is not condoning anything that was done to us, but it's releasing the very thing that we received in our relationship with God. And I realize on a Father's Day night, a lot of us, many of us in here, have, have issues towards our dad. And this is not a way to dishonor our fathers, but I realize that the reality of many of our hurts stem back to our relationship with our dad somehow. Maybe your dad wasn't around, maybe your dad wasn't there, and you feel like you were owed your childhood, you were owed these moments growing up, and because you didn't experience that, you projected anger in your heart, and you projected that into all of your relationships. And so this issue with our dad is really a, a big issue. Majority of people grow up in broken homes today. And a lot of these hurts that we have are directly towards probably family members in our lives. And there's this clip that I want to show. And every time I, I see it, 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 it's difficult to watch because it's a very real thing. And for many of us, it's going to trigger some moments in your life. But you're going to actually visually see what anger does in our hearts and how we have to choose to forgive. Take a look at the screen. Will, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, some business came up I got to handle. So we're going to have to put a, our trip on hold. You understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. That's cool. Just, just for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little longer. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Look, I'll, I'll call you next week and we'll iron out the details, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah. It was great seeing you, son. You too, Lou. Yeah. Yeah, um... I'm sorry, Will. <laughs> you know what, actually, this works out better for me. You know, the Slimmies of Summer come to class wearing next to nothing, you know what I'm well, saying? Well, it's all right to be angry. Hey, why should I be mad? I'm saying, at least he said goodbye this time. I just wish I hadn't wasted my money buying this stupid present. I'm sorry. I, you know, if there was something that I hey, could Hey, you know do. what? You ain't got to do no, nothing, Uncle Phil. Hey, you know, ain't like I'm still five years old, you know? Ain't like I'm going to be sitting up every night asking my mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket, but I learned, didn't I? Hey, I got pretty damn good at it, too, didn't I, yeah, Uncle Phil? Did. Got through my first day without him, right? Mm -hmm. I learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a damn card. Die out with him! I ain't need him then, and I don't need him now. Will. Nah, you know what, Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. I'm going to marry me a beautiful honey, and I'm having me a whole bunch of kids. I'm going to be a better father than he ever was. And I sure as hell don't need him for that, because ain't a damn thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. How come he don't want me, man? You know, I know for, for many of us that just kind of triggered some memories that people that you need to walk that through. And the reason why we do it forgiveness is forgiveness won't change our past, but it definitely has the power to change our future. We can't undo what was done to us, but we can make a decision to, to cancel the debt so that that doesn't affect our future. And our future is dependent on us doing the difficult thing. And I'm not saying this is easy. That's why it's a process. And I've walked this out myself, and I know how difficult it is firsthand. And the wrestling that you feel on the inside. But our heart needs it, and our relationship with God needs it, and God wants to bring healing in our lives as we do what He wants us to do in choose to forgive. We just head bowed and eyes closed. God is here and I know he's speaking to us tonight. And 
maybe you're listening to this message and you're wrestling with this on the inside because this is not something that's comfortable to hear, but you know this is something that God wants you to do. And it is a process. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's something that needs to be done. God, have your way, Lord. Speak to our hearts tonight, God, and help us to do the difficult thing. I'm asking that your spirit would come in a powerful way. God, that you would purge the root of anger from our lives through the process of forgiveness. And God, we can't do this without you, Lord. We know that we desperately need you to do this. And Holy Spirit, I just ask you that you would empower us to do this right now. It's a sovereign moment here, and I just sense that God is speaking to some of our hearts tonight to do this. And even as you were hearing this message, there was names and faces of individuals that came to your mind. And these are the individuals that God wants you to extend forgiveness towards. Not easy, but needed. And so, God, I pray that you give us the courage to do the difficult thing, to make a decision not based on how we feel, but based out of obedience to your word, to choose to forgive. Right where you are in your seats, just under your breath between you and God, just immediately begin to say, I choose to forgive, and insert their name, that person's name. Say, I choose to forgive so-and-so. Just right where you're at, and start to activate that. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. Say it over and over. And now I want you to start to say this. Now I cancel that debt. They don't owe me anymore. Say that. They don't owe me anymore. They don't owe me anymore. God, we thank you, Lord, that you canceled our debt. And we don't owe you anymore. And Lord, now we in this moment, we make a decision to choose to cancel these debt. These debts on these individuals who've hurt us, who've harmed us. God, we say... They don't know us anymore. We choose to release forgiveness to them. And God, I pray that right now, Lord, that you begin to fill our hearts with this perfect love from the Father that will fill every area of our hearts. Lord, we're going to shut the door of anger and bitterness in our hearts, and we're going to kick the enemy out, saying, you don't have any room here anymore. And we're going to say, Lord, that you would take, take over that room, God, that you would fill that area of our hearts so that you have every single part of us from the inside out. So, God, we trust you in this moment. Do what only you can do. Change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.